Hi, Professor John Didi here again, talking to you today about the presidency. The presidency is a fascinating office, and I often compare the presidency to being a football quarterback. You get too much credit when things go well, and too much blame when things go poorly. But as Harry Truman said, and most presidents have agreed, the buck stops here. In many ways, the president is a CEO of the entire nation. They're the ones where the command and control is. Our president today has the powers they have, as I've mentioned previously, because of the role of George Washington. And our founding fathers who writing the Constitution looked at our constitutional things and said, we trust Washington with these responsibilities. We're willing to give the presidency these responsibilities. And that's why our presidents have the powers they have in the Constitution. But they've also gained power over time through traditions and history. There's nothing in the Constitution that says the presidents can travel overseas, yet presidents have done this. The presidency in many ways has gained power because at a time of crisis, people turned to this office. After 9-11, people didn't turn to members of Congress, they turned to President Bush. During the coronavirus crisis, people turned to President Trump for answers. People turn to that office when something goes wrong. There are five major roles of the office of president. The first role is chief of state. And I often like to say this is the fun role of being president. This is the symbolic role, the Queen of England role, meeting Super Bowl champs, paying medals on people, giving speeches, the public relations role of the office. This is a role that men like Franklin Roosevelt, President Kennedy and President Reagan excelled at. If you've got good communication and people skills, this is a role that's easy to do. The second role of the president is the role of chief executive, the chief executive office of this land. And in that role, you're really making sure that the laws of the land are faithfully executed. Some presidents have done this role very well, others not so well. Dwight Eisenhower in 1957 sent federal troops to Little Rock, Arkansas to enforce Supreme Court decisions on integration. Eisenhower personally disagreed with the decision, but he saw himself in the role of, I have to enforce the law of the land, and did so. A few years later, President Kennedy did the same thing, sending troops this time to Mississippi to ensure and enforce the law of the land. The third role of the president is the role of chief legislator. This is the role I like to say is your first term role as president. This is the role of, I want to get laws passed. I want to work with Congress. I will do whatever it can to get things done. Men like Franklin Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson had a great deal of success working with Congress. And that's an important aspect. What is your working relationship with Congress in getting things done? As a chief legislator, you're putting your ideas out there first on the campaign trail, and then the Congress to say, here's what I want to get passed. Here is my legislative agenda. You want to show your accomplishments as president to get things done so you can get reelected. And that's an important element. Working with Congress, getting things done, getting things passed. A good working relationship with Congress makes you successful as a chief legislator. The fourth role of the president is the role of chief diplomat. And I often like to call this the role of the second term if you're reelected. This is the role of peacemaker. The first four years, it's about doing things with Congress, get reelected. The second four years, sometimes it's about legacy. What are you doing to be a peacemaker? Jimmy Carter did this in his first term <coughs> with the Camp David Accords. President Richard Nixon, being a personal introvert, was very comfortable dealing with foreign leaders and working on a variety of agreements from going to China to nuclear arms reductions. President Roosevelt, very successful as a chief diplomat, meeting with a variety of leaders during World War II. Presidents want to be seen as the peacemaker and seen as having accomplishments overseas. The fifth role of the president is an important role. It's the role of commander-in-chief. This was a role that in our Constitution, the president has. And our founding fathers in Philadelphia saw Washington as the perfect commander-in-chief. 
They looked at Washington, felt this is a role a president can do. The president controls the military. The military does not control the president. As commander-in-chief, you make a lot of variety of decisions. You're not planning D-Day, but you're discussing and dealing with military operations, often assigning things to it. As commander-in-chief, President Obama sent people to get bin Laden. As commander-in-chief, President Bush made decisions regarding Iraq. President Roosevelt, as commander-in-chief, made a variety of decisions, mainly putting George Marshall in charge of the war during World War II and letting Marshall make a lot of decisions. Presidents can be good at commander-in-chief or can have problems with commander-in-chief, such as President Lyndon Johnson had, making a variety of mistakes during the Vietnam War. These are the five roles of the president. And presidents generally don't do all five equally. You do the role you're comfortable with. Bill Clinton was never comfortable with commander-in-chief. It's hard to remember, but a long time ago, all of our presidents had always served in the military. Clinton was the first one that had not served and was micromanaged a lot during his presidency because when he would talk about making military decisions, he would get criticized. How dare you make that decision? You never served. And yet, President Trump, President Obama never served either. Times have changed. But presidents will pick the role they're comfortable with, focus on certain things. Reagan loved the role of chief of state. In his first term, he loved the role of being a chief legislator. In his second term, focused a great deal on being the chief diplomat and doing things like that. You pick and choose your roles. President Roosevelt <coughs> was someone who probably did all five roles very well. From his fireside chats, the making decisions regarding the economy and World War II. Last thing I want to talk about regarding the presidency is the role of the vice president. The role of the vice president is an important role. The vice presidential powers are very limited. In the Constitution, your powers are basically preside over the Senate, break any tie votes in the Senate. On average, there's one a year and become president if the president dies. It depends on the working relationship the vice president has with the president that allows them the powers they have. It was really until the 1960s where vice presidents were really seen and not heard. You were often selected to be vice president to help you carry a state. At times, it was a relationship of fraction and friction, not a relationship of two people who got along well. President Richard Nixon once referred to Vice President Agnew as his insurance policy because no one would ever kill Nixon because Agnew would become president. Jimmy Carter changed the role of the vice president by including Pro Vice President Mondale in various briefings and making sure any paper the president got, the vice president got. He also started the tradition that has continued with weekly lunches between the president and vice president to keep everyone in the loop about what's going on, to make sure that if something happens, the vice president is ready to become president. And this is very important because this has happened in recent history. A couple other little things I want to mention about the office of vice president. There is something called the 25th Amendment that says that the office of vice president becomes vacant. The president can name a replacement with the approval of Congress. Richard Nixon replaced Spiro Agnew after Agnew resigned with Gerald Ford. Congress approved and voted in favor of Ford, the House and Senate. Within less than a year, Gerald Ford named former New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller as his vice president. And for the first time in American history, we had a president and vice president running this country who were unelected by the American people. The 25th Amendment also covers the fact that if the president becomes disabled or there are issues, that the vice president can initiate actions with the cabinet to basically become an acting president. This can cover things such as mental imperities, but it can also cover what if the president is seriously wounded or hurt in an assassination attempt. Does he have the full function to be able to carry out the job? The 25th Amendment was put into place in the late 1960s, ratified by Congress after the reaction to the assassination of President Kennedy. 
One last thing I want to talk about regarding the vice presidency. The office is considered not that relevant sometimes, but it is an important office. And if a president and vice president have a good working relationship, it's to the benefit of the country. Take care. Have a great day.